Hello, hi everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Jiang Yijing. I'm an assistant professor of architecture at the Department of Architecture at Mansambia University. So I will briefly talk about YAPF, uh, which I recently joined the group as well. Uh, so the full name of YAPF is Young Architectural Practitioners Forum. And it's been developed primarily to promote and support young architects uh, and young architectural practitioners in the Northeast region. Uh, so it's led by a committee, committee member of the Northeast uh, based young architects. And it's including Andrea Ren is here, um, and uh, Phil is here, hi Phil, uh, Becky and myself, and we will we'll welcome anyone who are interested in joining the group, and please uh, just say hi, and um, will come to join the team. Um, please feel free to come in. Uh, so we are normally organizing events around this three things. Uh, one is learn, which around CPD and the learning events like tonight. Uh, also communication, uh, communicate social event, network event, and the engagement like community activities and the competitions between Nassambia and Newcastle University. Uh, so just some housekeeping information. We are currently at the very end of the room uh, as a corridor. Uh, so if you want to find the emergency exit, uh, it's on uh, your right hand side uh, when you exit, um, you know, before the left. Uh, you can see the red arrow here. Uh, the bathroom are also on the right hand side and you will find drinks including tea, coffee, beers, and red, and, uh, red wine on the back. So feel free to grab your drinks. Uh, we are planning to take some photos uh, to promote the event. If you uh, do want to not be included in your photos, please feel free to let us know. So in the next couple of slides, I will briefly talk about um, the research project I'm doing with um, Professor Richard Lang. And um, so when we are uh, at first engaging in this YAPF events, we are bringing down uh, the ideas for the skill for success event. And at that time, I recently got this uh, HRC funded project uh, with Richard. And we think maybe it's a uh, right opportunity to start from there. Uh, so, uh, so the event is around this urban rejuvenations uh, between the brown to green transition in cities. So in our project, we are collaborating with Omanos Analytic, which is a Glasgow-based uh, data analytic firm. So we are basically look at a uh, turn plot along the river town, and we are um, conduct community surveys and the grant data collection uh, for the urban infrastructure development and the ground, uh, ground choosing of satellite images. And we also develop a participatory app to collect uh, local people's uh, views and opinions on urban transition based on this map, which will be launched very soon. And if you are interested, uh, we hope uh, you can be part of this research. And it's also a two-way approach so we are comparing the uh, community intelligence also with the satellite data. Uh, so there's uh, layers of information we are gathering and we hope our funding could contribute to this uh, brown to green transition. So back to the topic of uh, tonight. Um, so uh, we understand um, sometimes this kinds of project can be very difficult in reality. In some urban settings, they may encounter several types of obstacles, barriers, and resistance. And we are classified that into four categories, including social cultural barriers, government challenges, uh, legal and regulatory um, resistance, and the deterrent cost. So tonight, we hope um, we, we have two sessions from two uh, architects and they're traveling very far uh, for these lectures. So we hope this session will offer valuable insights for young architects and architectural students, urban researchers to enable us to integrate and adopt planning uh, regulations uh, to the real project to facilitate the human-centered and sustainable urban transition. 
So I will hand over to Professor Richard Lam to introduce the speakers. Thanks, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, um, as Jennifer said, I'm Richard Lang. So I'm a, I'm a professor from our Department of Architecture and Built Environment, and we've been working on the Brown to Green project together now for about nine or ten months. It's been a fascinating project to work on, and I feel it connects quite well with the two talks that we have this evening. The project itself, we're looking at on South Shields and North Shields as the areas which were previously, like a number of years ago, kind of very heavy industry areas with a lot of evidence of shipbuilding um, in the area. But when I talk about evidence of shipbuilding, it's also been interesting for us that when we've gone for a walk around the area, that are like disused docks that used to be used. And th these are quite significant in terms of size. Um, but I think that kind of challenge, coupled with some aspects of built heritage where it wasn't entirely sure, it wasn't entirely obvious to us walking around the towns what these buildings or remnants of buildings ever were in the past. So trying to understand how they can be brought back into use perhaps, but in a way that makes people feel that it's made their community a nicer place to be um, is kind of important to us. So we do have various QR codes that will flash up and so on. If you'd like to come on any of these walks with us and take photos and tell us what you think, then you're more than welcome to do so. Um, we've got a couple of speakers this evening um, and we're really kind of honoured to um, have them in the department from Hawkins, Brown and Smith Scott Mullen Associates. So um, that'll be Dave Gibson from Hawkins Brown and Eugene Mullen um, as our second speaker this evening. Um, Dave, I think his work, it, it, it seems particularly interesting to me because um, having worked in schools of architecture and built environment for many years, so many students will say, or so many people at the early part of the career will say that they're interested in things like adaptive reuse. But then you kind of trace the careers of those people when they get into practice, and it's, it can be difficult sometimes to see examples of how that was actually played out in a real setting and in a sustainable manner. So I think a lot of the work that Dave is going to tell us about actually touches on how some of these really important ideas can actually be enacted in practice. So without further ado, um, uh, Dave Gibson. Brilliant. Uh, all right, uh, got a bit of script here, but uh, we'll just kind of go with the flow. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dave Gibson, as, as mentioned. Um, thank you very much for having me today. It's uh, wonderful to come up to Newcastle. Um, really, uh, really enjoying coming back to a city that I've, I've only recently started to get to know. And so another opportunity to kind of come and visit uh, this kind of really exciting place to a uh, place to be, so um, yeah. Um, so a bit about um, myself. As as already mentioned, I'm a, I'm a practicing architect um, primarily, but also working um, also in uh, the urban design um, sort of scale of projects. So um, focusing around sort of building reuse and regeneration of historic assets. On, on various scales from right down to the detail of working with how bricks and mortar are put together in, in historic environments, all the way up to um, huge um, urban areas, up to kind of 150 acres across, across um, uh, urban environments across northern England. Um, I work for Hawkins Brown, as it practices as us, and um, stood outside our recently completed phase two of um, Central Foundation Boys School in London. Uh, we're a practice of around 300, 300 people uh, made up of, of architects, interior designers, urban designers, sustainability specialists, um, conservation architects, researchers, and many more people that build up the fabric of, of, of Hawkins Brown. And as I said myself, I'm, I'm based in, in the Manchester studio there for around seven years now, um, but we have five other studios across London, Dublin, Edinburgh and LA, so spreading our work across um, predominantly in the UK, but also Europe and Northern America. 
So ourselves, um, uh, we we practice with um, kind of experience and knowledge across a multitude of sectors, across a multitude of scales. Um, but what we really find interesting is the point where where these come together and create real, true mixed use places. Um, and those being places for, for people to live, work, grow, learn and play. And that is where people are at the heart of what we do. We hope to make spaces that are, are not just functional, but places that are, are playful and profound for those that use them. And whilst we talk about kind of creating, um, kind of creating places that are playful, we're not just playful, we're very serious about things such as climate and biodiversity crisis. So as you, you probably know, as, as, as relatively talked about, the built environment causes around 42% of, of the UK's carbon emissions. And this is a shocking statistic that none of us should or hide from. Or hide from. And we constantly challenge ourselves, our clients, our collaborators, and also our competitors to do better at building to a planet and for people. And what we embed is the idea of whole life design. And that, that is kind of built into our fabric. So we're pioneers in sustainable design, and we have been from the, from the point at which the practice was founded. Um, we have support from an in-house sustainability team um, that, that look to embed these principles through, taking, uh, through uh, undertaking research, developing new technical tools to support design, and contributing to industry uh, guidance. But most of all, we embed these principles into our, into our projects, placing emphasis on minimising the reliance on resources and carbon-heavy development, whilst investing in trying to improve the experience, health and well-being of people and all living things. So how do we go about creating more sustainable places? We start from first principles, early site, site analysis, climatic analysis, to guide design, design moves, massing, orientation, and exploiting passive design principles within all our designs. We have invested into developing tools to enable us to analyze embodied carbon in our projects with the aim to minimize and achieve net zero carbon on all our projects. We're leading the conversation on thermal performance, striving to challenge fuel poverty and improving quality of living standards for all residents. And this is particularly demonstrated through delivering world leading passive house developments. And we see the benefits of improving biodiversity and integrating biophilia into all our buildings and our proposals and therefore generating opportunities to improve people's access to nature and seeing the positive impact this has on mental health and well-being. But the focus of my talk is going to talk around kind of four key topics, and that being kind of regenerative design, so considering the impact our work has on all life systems, from aiming to conserve animal populations, to the health of our soils, the cleanliness of our waters, and the health of our society. Through building reuse and structures, so existing buildings and structures have the potential for, for kind of retaining significant amounts of embodied carbon already established in these assets. And this can be from individual components such as a steel beam all the way up to a full building fabric itself. And that we can creatively think about how we can reuse these and finding the best ways to work with what we already have rather than kind of building new and that creates an opportunity to retain cultural heritage and character in the places that we live. Focusing on establishing climate resilience within our city cities and developing strategies, um, particularly within our, our public realm environments, so designing places to mitigate and respond to the, the changing climate through reduction in CO2 emissions, improving air quality and managing heat risk and flood risk in our environments. And finally, embedding longevity, longevity into our design, so bringing people into the, the ownership of places, in that, um, investing in high quality materials is kind of core in giving, giving people that, that focus to, through use, um, you can create care and, and uh, consideration for the, the future maintenance um, of our spaces. 
So there's two projects I'm going to focus on today. Um, we have Tile Yard North, also known as, as Rutland Mills, based in Wakefield. This is a, 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 historic, a refurbishment of a historic mill complex um, for a new mixed-use development. And then Thames Tideway in London bring in a creation of a, a new super sewer through, through the, the heart of London City. So, Tower Yard North. So this is a project, we started it in around, I think, 2016. Um, it looks at the, the regeneration of a complex of grade, grade two listed former mill buildings on the banks of the River Calder. This brings forward a mixed use creative campus in the centre of Wakefield. The site itself was a former integrated worsted mill built by Isaac Briggs, and the mill was built in a multitude of phases between the 1800s and 1930s. Each building with a different scale and size and character contributes to the, the setting of the, the buildings as a whole complex. You can see it has great frontage onto the, the River Calder and this was, this was primarily in, in supporting the actual functionality of the mill where they brought goods in and goods out of the site. Unfortunately, uh, in the 1970s, the, the operation of the mill ceased, and, uh, and since then there's been um, kind of li little occupation of the site, um, leading to... Um, where are we going? Going the wrong way. Where are we? Um, leading to it, its kind of current state as we found it. So the site itself sits within a, uh, a wider regeneration master plan known as Wakefield Waterfront. This is around 10 acres of, of land and you can see it's a mixture of existing, um, existing warehouses that were refurbished, new build uh, residential and office developments and then most notably the Hepworth designed, designed by David Chipperfield um, with its kind of unique concrete, concrete forms and adjacent to it, the recently completed Hepworth Gallery Garden by Tom Stewart Smith. And so Rutland Mills formed this sort of um, moment that, that um, trapped the, the kind of future potential of the, the Wakefield Waterfront itself. It was the last piece that would join that all together. So the site itself is made up of, of nine existing buildings at the point we found it. Um, and when we, when we found it, they were in a state of, of dilapidation and, and disrepair, and this is kind of caused through 20 years of inactivity on the site. They were pigeon infested, had leaking roofs, and there was a formation of significant structural deterioration across the site. So the site was not in a healthy state and needed a new, life, uh, new lease of life to be injected into Rutland Mills. So our proposals, we look to promote the, uh, the refurbishment and retention of six of the existing buildings and those being the most predominant um, buildings within the, within the complex um, and then supported by the, the new creation of a new uh, office building. To come to that, that proposal um, that I'll kind of run through the details of as we move on the, the, the start point was to really understand the site, and particularly from its, its built heritage value. So each, each building was assessed um, to understand its, its heritage significance, the, the particular architectural quality and details that were involved in each of the buildings, including things such as the polychromatic heads and the detailed corbeling on the, uh, the eaves of the buildings, and also kind of fully understanding all the structural um, and uh, floor and wall build-ups within each of the buildings to understand how they, they performed um, structurally and thermally. This then helped us kind of evaluate and assess each of the buildings to come up with a retention strategy for the site. And that, as part of that, we undertook kind of um, space planning exercises to understand the reuse potential of each of those buildings to actually really evaluate how, how these buildings might come forward in the, in the future and if it is suitable for retention. It's probably, probably fair to say at the point that we were developing these proposals 
Um, measuring embodied carbon was still in its infancy. We hadn't really um, uh, developed the tools that we now work with these days. So a lot of what we were working with was um, working with first principles to do the best we can. Um, but what we, we came up with was with a, a strategy that allowed us to retain around 80% of the existing floor space built fabric and structure across the site um, that um, uh, eventually resulted in the loss and demolition of three of the buildings, particularly due to their, their structural condition or the, um, the, the public benefit and development benefit that we, we would get from their, their removal. So what that helped us create is a site with, with some key principles to the master plan that um, we drove through. And whilst there was the retention of the buildings, which were kind of um, locked pieces in the site's arrangement, there was new public realm uh, moves that we introduced, including new, new pedestrian streets going north-south, connecting, um, connecting the two sites um, through Whitefoot Waterfront alongside an east-west corridor or spine through the site that took um, visitors from uh, road to provide new access and activation onto the River Calder and really maximising that, that frontage and access to the riverfront. Along that spine we also are looking to introduce opportunities for sustainable urban drainage to help mitigate any surface uh, water runoff um, that might build up on this kind of relatively low setting, low setting site. And furthermore, we've, we've introduced a new, um, flood, uh, new flood wall that spans the entirety of the site, protecting it and its, its wider context from, from future flooding. Um, on the front, on the, um, the frontage to the buildings so facing the Hepworth Gallery, we've introduced new activation and entrances that really maximise the opportunity of the, the adjacent new green space at the Hepworth Gallery Garden. And then to complement against that, we've, we've created a new central event space that acts as the heart to the site itself, being uh, provide an opportunity for, for a mixture of uh, cultural and, and food events within the, the, the complex. And this, is the, this was the vision before we, we, we went to site and took the, took the um, proposals to a technical design. And what you see is we're, we're trying to really <coughs> celebrate the, the character of the, the existing buildings and where we are introducing new interventions such as the new vertical circulation cores which limit the, the impact we have on, um, on introducing new vertical circulation internally of the existing buildings. Um, therefore kind of impact, uh, minimising any impact on that existing uh, listed fabric um, and then alongside that introducing a, a new office, office building that, that um, took characteristics in a more, of the existing buildings in a more contemporary manner um, that um, playfully kind of um, showed that decoration in, in, in a new way and that, that new building provides the enclosure to that, that central courtyard. So following technical design, we then actually got on site. We've, we've undertaken phase 1A, which is the, the completion of four of the buildings and the, the central, um, central uh, heart space, so that being building 7, 9, 10 and carding shed providing space for a mixture of education, stu music studio space, office space, and a flexible event hall. It's all, all of those have already kind of been, become active and, and used and the community is already being established in, the, in those buildings. We're now on site with phase 1B, providing a, a new hotel within the, um, uh, within the Caddy's Wainwright building and that having a new riverfront pier coming off of that and then finally we're on, on also on site with phase two looking to bring forward the, the Phoenix Mill, the oldest building on the site which is a stone, stone warehouse and then adjacent to that the, uh, the new office building 
and that, that then will eventually provide that enclosure to the heart space. So this is, this is Rutland Mills probably around, I'd say around two months ago when we took the, took the picture. So you can see the, the completed um, phase one and then phase, phase 1B undergo with its new kind of new uh, river pier and the, the flood wall kind of sitting against there and then the, the refurbishment of, of Caddy's Wainwright kind of fully wrapped in the scaffold. And this just gives a bit of a, an understanding on the, the scale of the complex and the, the, the level of impact of what we're, we're bringing forward has on the area. So as we, as we kind of see on screen, there's a couple of examples of, of before and after shots. And this kind of shows the level of intervention that we've, we've introduced where we've tried to open up, uh, reveal and celebrate existing characters of the site, showing uh, the texture and quality of workmanship that was crafted in the original buildings. New interventions such as the, the frontage on Tootle Street um, celebrate and, and show the legibility between the, uh, the various different blocks. Um, we have uh, the carding shed sitting on the, the left here with a new entrance moment. This was actually slotted into a moment of the carding shed that had uh, slipped. It had a, a six metre long crack running through the, the building and was, was deemed unsuitable for use. So we had to stitch that, carefully stitch that element of the building out and introduce this new, in, new intervention to safeguard the rest of the building but it provided that, that entrance moment that, that signified along quite an expansive length of brickwork. You then see in the centre building 10 um, with its kind of dominant feature um, over the, the rest of the complex. And then poking in the distance, you can just see the, the creation of, of a new chimney structure. This sits on the, the existing truncated um, chimney um, that was taken taken down in the 90s, and we, we look to uh, re reinstate this as a landmark moment to, s to celebrate the site and landmark it within the wider context. So when you're when you're approaching Wakefield on the train, you can see it from from quite a significant distance. And then internally, we've we've stripped back, stripped back, simplified, and, and cleaned up the existing fabric really celebrate the, the quality and workmanship of the, the existing um, brickwork, um, cleaned up and, and uh, reinstated a lot of the, the structural steel work, and then introduced new, new roofs to, to kind of enclose and protect the spaces internally. Particularly what was kind of challenging in, in, in this, this process was balancing the, the need to bring these buildings up to contemporary standards to make them perform both thermally uh, from light um, requirements um, but also balancing that against the, the heritage significance of the buildings. Um, but what we've managed to introduce is a, is a predominantly passive strategy where we, all buildings rely on um, natural ventilation but are then supported by a, a mixed mode of, of mechanical ventilation through each of the spaces, allowing tenants to, to operate their, their demises as they require. And what this has really allowed is to, to bring, the life, the, uh, bring the site back into life, bring craft into the buildings and bring making and creation back into the buildings. So we have a whole host of, of different uses from music studios there's a distillery on site, um, regular music events are held, so Tile Yard um, were originally a London-based London uh, music complex, decided to relocate their, a, a London home, uh, their London home up to, to Manchester, uh, not up to Manchester, up to Wakefield, so having this, this northern, northern um, asset um, to kind of reach their, their potential. Um, 
So this is the, the site. You can see uh, from Tootle Street the, the quality of, of the existing brickwork with new, new window interventions, really um, enhancing the, the green space that, that sits adjacent within the Hepworth Gallery Garden and that being quite a luscious and calm environment that, that visitors to the Hepworth and, and Rutland Mills can utilise. In contrast, we've, we've introduced our new courtyard, and this is, this is Peddler Market, sitting within the centre of, of that courtyard. Had around, on its first weekend, had around 2,000 visitors across the weekend to celebrate music and food, and they've got their, their second event is actually happening this weekend, so starting tomorrow night. That's going to be really fantastic to see that that coming forwards. So, obviously, it's really really good to see those existing buildings um, in use. But the the story hasn't finished there. We're we're continuing um, with the next phases. So, coming forward, as I said, we've in phase one B, we've got the Caddies Wainwright building, providing a new hotel and pier space really providing access onto that, that riverfront destination. That then supported by the, the new, build, um, new build office block that, that provides that enclosure to the, the courtyard space and really uh, creates this as a, as a campus feel. And this is, this is us on site at the moment. So uh, the, the scaffolding is starting to come off the Caddies Wainwright, and you can see new new lime mortar sitting within the within the brickwork, which really brings it out. Beforehand, it, it, it read as quite a monolithic, dull building, and um, the new the new kind of work that the contractor has undertaken has started to really celebrate that that existing um, brickwork, and then we'll introduce the new circulation core um, up that gable, and then adjacent is the new building where you can see the, the sort of scale of of um, development that we're, we're sitting alongside these, these heritage assets. So what Rotland Mills looks to do um, is, is it demonstrates a, a really considered approach to strategic planning of a, of a large historic site um, and thinking about it in a considered way that uh, in a considered way that doesn't just look within the red line of the site but looks, looks out, outside of it to make, make um, a, a community really embedded into a set of existing buildings as they come forward in a, in a, in a phased way. So the next project I'm going to talk about is, is Thames Tideway. This is probably a once in a lifetime opportunity to reimagine um, one of London's largest open spaces. It provides a, a major city-wide investment in London's waterways inf infrastructure and enhances the relationship between um, the city and the River Thames. So London, throughout its growth and history, has seen significant growth, particularly around the, the waterfront of the River Thames and that being the, the kind of the central node to the city. In around the 1800s there was around 2 million people and around that time that created and led on to the Great Stink in 1858 that meant living around the river unbearable. So in response to this the city commissioned Basil Jett to create his sewer system throughout London and this is one of London's uh, largest infrastructure projects um, that was created at that time and as a city London is still relying on it over 150 years later and as part of that that then allowed the creation of new access and frontages onto the the riverfront that turned it from an industrious um, environment to a, quite a civic uh, and celebrated space for the, the, the residents of London so the problem now is that since then the city has grown fourfold to around 8 million people and the result presents a challenge where there's an increase in foul and waste water and surface water alongside that that the, the current sewage system can't manage or have the resilience 
or capacity to hold. So our project with Thames Tideway, which started um, around 2015, I think was our, our first involvement, um, it looks to provide a new super sewer to carry um, the additional load out of, out of the city to treatment facilities in the Thames estuary and therefore creating a cleaner, um, a cleaner River Thames. And along this thread of a super sewer, there are moments where critical infrastructure comes to surface, providing access and servicing to the engineering space below, below ground. Um, and this is, it was, it's at these landing moments where Hawkins Brown's involvement is focused. We're leading architecture and public realm design for eight sites within the central region of London. Um, and this spanning from um, Falcon Brook pumping station to the west, all the way to Blackfriars Bridge foreshore in the east. So design proposals include, um, include new landscape on top of these, these complex civil engineering infrastructure structures. In the t that are jutting out into the Thames and underneath the Thames. These, sp these spaces look to introduce a necklace of vibrant destinations along the river and a whole new exper experience of the water's edge. Um, and there, and that, that creates opportunities for, for people to experience the riverfront differently and experience new views of the river. So we're on site right now delivering these. Um, both the infrastructure and the public realm. And on screen you can see the sort of scale these, these pipes and sewers are. They're around the vertical, um, vertical pipes down to the main sewer around 20 metres in width. Um, so quite significant spaces. And this will provide the capacity that the, the, the future city needs. Um, Construction is very complex, um, particularly with, with building out into a, a river setting. Um, you've got challenges of, of holding back water and uh, many challenges of uh, quite an established um, below ground um, constraints that, that sit around the sites. Obviously the, build, the, the city's been around for, for hundreds of years and, and lots of, of below ground service and sits underneath the, the, this area. So the platforms that we're, we're looking to create uh, are introducing new public realm and collectively um, within the central region it, itself they're, they, they're, um, they're creating around a similar amount of, of public, public realm offer that, that Trafalgar Square alone um, has. So it is um, throughout the city is quite a si significant commitment of, of public realm that the, the city are cr creating for people. At these destination points, the design of these spaces both have a, a consideration to the wider urban identity of Thames Tideway, but also each one has a specific um, site response, and that being responding to the character and constraints of each site individually. Such elements include the landscape in response to the constant change in nature of the river, with its tidal patterns um, going up, up and down on a daily basis, as seen at Chelsea Embankment with the, the stepped terrace and sweeping forms. The sites look out to celebrate and maximise the opportunity for views along the riverfront, but also focus themselves to express and make visible the, the infrastructure that they, they sit above. So, for instance, you can see these chimneys which have ventilation ducts and service ducts coming out the top of them. But more so, they're, they're, they're an opportunity for people to gather and experience the heart of the city and one of London's greatest open, um, open space assets and a chance to escape the hustle and bustle of the city streets. And as part of our design proposals, um, including the, this balustrade detail that we have. We've de developed a carefully and considered design framework and common language of parts that are integrated across the, each of the sites and create um, that kind of common language and thread that runs through all the sites 
so you can see them um, and recognise that they're part of the Thames Tideway project. But as mentioned, um, we also have a, a, a site-specific response at each of the each of the platforms, and this is generated through a strong understanding of the local communities, each of the unique river edge conditions within their their sites, and also the the pragmatic requirements of the infrastructure that is introduced uh, below each of these these sites. And the design team we're embracing. Um, a collaborative process uh, alongside artists to introduce and integrate a diverse range of artworks into the architecture and landscape. Particularly taking consideration for Blackfriars Bridge Foreshore, uh, we've been working alongside Nathan Coley to develop um, an idea of stages throughout the public realm. So the new foreshore will extend out and um, out towards the River Thames, introducing a stepped landscape that terraces down from the roadway to the river, introducing a mixture of hard and soft um, planting, which creating a, a dynamic um, frontage uh, along, the, along the river next to Blackfriars Bridge. And you can see on there, there's these, these moments of, um, of stages that are, are in introduced within the, the landscape. And each one of these bold inf interventions provides a monolithic quality of di each one with different scales, proportions, form, to invite people to experience the place in different ways, allowing visitors to sit, view, play, meet and gather. The stages are a direct response to the ingenuity and innovation of Basel Jet's sewer system. In the 19th century, the sewer system utilised Portland cement to bond the brickwork materials, um, bond, uh, bond the brickworks together. And this was, at the time, a material that was quite innovative and untested. So to reflect this, this courage and ingenuity, um, our, our interventions look to use contemporary innovations um, through, um, through prefabrication and, and um, modern materials. So we've, um, we're utilizing a, a Techcrete limestone concrete black aggregate for a series of prefabricated uh, panel units that build up and make up each of the stage components. And this prefabricated process allows us to, to minimize the, the time spent on site creating these and therefore impact, uh, minimising our impact both on the, the site constraints but also um, uh, site considerations such as programme and cost. Mock-ups and testing of these stages, such as shown on screen, um, with the water wall um, itself, um, have been vital to the development and realisation of the artist's commission to ensure that the quality and robustness of the artwork will be able to suit the exposed and marine environment. Whilst ensuring, as a team, we have captured the artist's vision. So the completion of, tide, of Tideway is due in 2025, and once complete, a city -wide, uh, with, uh, at a city-wide scale, this will be a critical piece of infrastructure that will protect and ensure the health and environmental quality of the River Thames the next hundred years. But down to the human scale it provides these small moments for the eight million residents of London and the, and the various visitors to the city, a chance to escape, rest and enjoy one of London's greatest open assets. Thanks very much. Thanks very much Dave. I, I think we'll have time after our second speaker for um, Kind of general questions and discussion, but I was wondering, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask at the moment? I think we've got time for one or two. With the, um, the Rutland Mill site, there's not a solar panel, there's not a wind turbine, there's not a water wheel, you've got a huge river, you've got that massive tower. Was no thought given to that? Um, we, we did consider it. Um, there was a lot of challenge in terms of integrating things such as solar panels on the historic buildings, a lot of pushback from the local authority on emphasising on those, those elements. Um, 
So where we focused our effort was making sure that uh, where we introduced uh, new mechanical systems to support the site, it was predominantly electrified um, and, and relied on, on kind of oxide renewables to, to support the site. I want to comment on historic England pushing back against what you wanted to do. But yeah. Are there any other questions before we hear from our second speaker? Okay, well, thanks very much, Dave. Thank you.